So, uh, time requires me to, sh to introduce you to the generalized dissimilarity model of, of GDM. Uh, are any of you familiar with this? You probably are familiar. Yes. Just heard about that. Well, I heard about that too, more or less. <laughs> well, a GDM model is a, a relatively new tool which, is, which can be quite useful at uh, predicting species turnover, beta diversity, and, and I think that if we go back to Tom's presentation in the morning, one, it's possible that one of the best applications that this model can have is in, in dealing with a, a, what we might call now endemic species. Because uh, uh, it's well suited to solve one general problem of the ecological and environmental distances. Um, over time, there's been a, a, it's been a relationship where is it, between ecological and environmental distance, we, which most models had assumed to be linear, which is not really the case. So, if you represent here the ecological distance, Uh, the environmental distance, sorry. Well, it doesn't matter. And the you represent both types of uh, no, I did it wrong, sorry. The underlying gradient should be in this axis. So this is environmental distance and this could be actually anything. So you, ca you could take environmental distance as an actual physical distance, actual geographical distance, because the environments will change along a gradient. Remember, you, you move from here up to the mountains, you have a gradient, so the m farther away you are, uh, the more environmental distance you have, and you get the ecological distance here. You would expect some kind of linear relationship. Uh, say, let's say that it takes this form. Whereas, in fact, this, this isn't true. The relationship between ecological distance and environmental distance tends to be curvilinear. And that <coughs> wreaks havoc in most models. This is basically what. Uh, uh, what GDM was designed to cope with. So this means that the rate, the rate of turnover is not constant over time. And it's not, sorry, over space. Hmm? You might have fast gradients in which the turnover is quite fast. Very soon species disappear and are replaced by others. And some in some other places along the gradient, the turnover is smaller. Why is it so? There are a number of causes. One of them could be that the species, uh, ecologically tolerant species, tend to be spread more over the gradient, whereas the narrow species tend to be more concentrated somewhere. So as the gradient gets into more extreme conditions, the less tolerant species will disappear, whereas the, the more tolerant species will stay. This is one possible explanation, there are many. But in any case, what the GDM does is try to detrain this curve, or rather to cope with it, by using a modification of the matrix correlation analysis. So, here you have an environmental gradient, for instance, you have the species composition, the species composition, and you see that rather than having a, uh, say, it's straight band, they will change at a different rate at different places. Let's assume that we say that the ecological distance has been, has been measured as a dissimilarity measure. It could be, well, in this case, the dissimilarity measure that's by choice is the break cortis index. And uh, let's say that the separation, the environmental gradient, could be the environmental space, as we saw yesterday or the, uh, Tuesday, or it could be the distance, the actual distance between sites, or whatever kind of measure that 
uh, you have that separates physically uh, the, the samples or along the environment. So we have this curvilinear relationship that is not even constant. I mean, it depends on how the sites are and how the samples are. So for you specifically, the problem is that this curvilinear relationship is even greater when there is a lot of rare species in highly diverse systems. A highly diverse system or a highly diverse ecosystem is, remember, uh, the partitioning concept, is a, co is a place in which the space has been partitioned into many classes. High diversity, many species. <coughs> Same space, more classes. Which means that, naturally, some of the species will be rare enough to be very difficult to find. So, I would say that a highly diverse ecosystem is a, systems, is a system in which, when you have a number of samples, you will have a lot of zeros. A lot of zeros. Because there will be a lot of strange rare species that will uh, be only found after extensive sample. <coughs> in that case, in a highly diverse country uh, uh, environment, then you have a curvilinear relationship which is even more curved than in less diverse sites. Well, uh, the GDM was developed and documented by Ferrer et al. You have the paper in, in the documentation. It's quite heavy, but basically it compares, uh, it tries to address <coughs> this nonlinearity here by a number of techniques and basically, very basically, it's a form of matrix regression that can cope with nonlinearity. It's a non-linear matrix regression. How does it? Well, it does it by using splines, by making a predictor, a set of predictors that are curvilinear using spline lines. And uh, other than that, basically it's a GLM, it's a general linear model that you are familiar with. So it's a, let's say that it's a general linear model that can be bent. And how it's bent is it's in the guts of, of this GTM. So this tool exists, it's a, bit, a little bit complex, uh, and that's the, how you fit a GTM, and this is only the, the initial part. I mean, each of these uh, paragraphs has to be expanded a lot with a lot of caveats. Don't worry about that. Don't, you don't need to get into, into that depth. If you are going to use GTM, you'll have to read it, but mm, for now on, just suffice to say that this is a very useful tool for uh, looking at beta diversity in environmental spaces where there is a lot of species, there is a high diversity, and therefore also a high beta. Mm? And also when there is a lot of zeros in your species. Mm? So um, basically this is what the model looks like. You get a linear predictor and you have an observer compositional, which is obviously cool, and then the model will give you a set of predictors that can be applied to the, to, the, to the model, which rather than linear, are curvilinear, and this, the form of this curve is exactly what the GDM calculates. So uh, it calculates a function, a function which is not linear, a function that is corrected uh, by the, uh, the matrix uh, regression. 